All right, everyone, welcome back to the Fly Fishing Insider Podcast. This week, we have a really cool uh, guest with us, and that's Max McCool. Max um, reached out to me after listening to the podcast from Dalton Romanowski, which is Portland area Stillwater, which I thought was really cool. And then when I started talking to Max and looking at his Instagram page, et cetera, I realized this guy isn't just your average guy. He's a pretty regular angler. And what I really loved about you, Max, was you had this background in ecology. And I thought that'd be a fantastic uh, subject for our show is to talk a little bit of ecology, et cetera, on it. So um, let me do this. Let me just introduce you real quick so everybody knows, who's, knows exactly who you are. You're an ecologist. Perfect. You've been fishing since a kid, started fishing with your dad. Um, but you've fished all over, mountain streams, you know, standard streams and rivers, et cetera. And lately you've been in Portland area. So your focus has been on um, native trout and coastal streams. So we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit today as well. So our agenda for today is to talk about some uh, river ecology and what that means and how that comes into play for us, et cetera. But then we're going to talk about um, some of the tips that you provided. And a lot of that associates to your Instagram page. So we're going to um, talk about that as well. And then lastly, I would just want to give a kind of cleaning house scenario here for everybody. Um, if you haven't already, check us out on YouTube. We're now live there in video every episode. We also have other videos that fall into various categories like fly tying and tips, etc. And then um, we're now also available on OutdoorEchoes.com. Outdoor Echoes is a network of outside enthusiast podcasts, and uh, you can find us there. The last and very uh, important thing for me is go check us out on the blog. It's so wealth worth, uh, worth it. Um, I have articles on reviews, articles on various products. Uh, I've written articles on how to's, etc. So you can really learn uh, quite a bit there and um, take advantage of that. So we'll see you guys soon. And um, what we're going to do is jump off into the conversation with Max here today about some river ecology. Max. How you doing? You nervous? I'm, I'm doing all right. I, yeah, <laughs> just a just a little bit, but I'm uh, I'm really excited to get to talk to you. Like you said, you know, I watched that episode with Dalton about kind of some of the Bend area stillwaters, and that was right after I got back from uh, a trip to the Metolius myself, and it was um it was really cool, man. I uh, really psyched to be on the show. Good, man. Good. Well, we're glad to have you. And um, ecology is a special spot for me because. I think you and I were talking earlier and I said, look, a lot of people get sucked into match the hatch and it's this, I want to tie my bug to be an exact match or I want to make sure I have the the right fly. And really in the equation of things for me, the, the right fly isn't the exact fly. Right. But what I like to more so focus on is very first is the silhouette being repeated. Am I covering yeah. the silhouette of the fly? Can I ante up that? Yeah, I can ante up that by adding in a color scenario. But fish aren't down there counting the number of tails on a stonefly or um, nymph, et cetera, right? Um, yeah. They're opportunists in eating, and they're going to usually pick something that's similar in size and similar in color. And you could be yeah. super successful doing that. Now, you did... Give me the devil's advocate of high pressure waters. Talk about that a little bit for me. Yeah, yeah, and like everything else with fly fishing, I think it's just situational. Like for instance, I was in uh, I was in Missoula this summer. I love that area, you know, definitely a, a spot very close to my heart. And I was in one of their local fly shops. Um, I think it was Grizzly Hackle, and I was talking to them about like, you know, the opportunities kind of closer to town because I was staying in town for a couple of days. And they said, you know, the Clark's Fork has some opportunities, but you know, those are some of the most educated fish. And I, I kind of love that word that he picked in particular was educated fish you know they've seen every pattern they've seen you know and so those fish are definitely a little bit um a little bit more hesitant to bite just any fly that you put on that water right but then you have like mm -hmm. kind of the alternate scenario where you're at like high alpine lakes or something else where the fish just need to be opportunists and sometimes you'll have a lot of luck just tossing out a big looking salmon fly or something like that because they see it as a super rich protein source and they're like okay well this fly is there. I'm an opportunist. I know that, you know, this opportunity yep. isn't going to be there that long. And even if you're not matching the hatch, you know, you can still have a lot of success with that. And so I think that in most cases, the normal streams are a happy medium, kind of like you talked about, where it's 
matching the silhouette, going with, you know, kind of uh, some general hatch species that you can look at too. I honestly, the first fly that I always use, and this is kind of just a personal thing for me, a parachute Adams mm-hmm. is honestly, especially in yep. Oregon, one of the best flies that you can toss out first. No matter what yeah. the hatch is, Montana, Utah, Idaho, Colorado, always the first fly that I put out there, unless it's like a very specific river where it's like, okay, I know that I need to like, you know, it's too high. I need to fish like a leech pattern or something like that. Parachute Adams just, just work for me. And it's, it's a good general kind of looking fly that you can, you can usually yep. have some success with. Yeah, I agree. That's one of my favorite flies. And yeah. For a mayfly pattern, um, you know, outside of like hyper specific catches, like we get a big green drake catch and it's right, right, you can right. try tie green drakes, you know. Um, but from a general mayfly pattern, I usually tie it in like three or four sizes, skip a size in between, you know, down to the 20s, up, you know, into the 12s. And yeah. It, you can get away with so much. The other thing you can do with that fly that's really <laughs> nice is if you tie it in a light green, or I'm sorry, a light gray, mm-hmm. just take a Sharpie with you. Yeah. You can change the color, at yeah. least to all the dark yeah. colors. And the gray gets by with any of the yellows and, and whatnot from what I've seen. So right. um, I would fiddle with that. The last thing I really like about that fly is if you ever tie it, instead of tie a handful of each size where mm-hmm. the post is black antron. And the reason you do that is that black antron, it sounds weird, but when you're in um, a light situation where you're getting a lot of glare, that black will stand out really, really well. It stands out better than like a fluorescent pink or something. Right. Um, but it that contrast stands out really well. I think the last thing I would add to your comment is, um, in mine, is people get enamored with areas like um, uh, Henry's Fork or the Ranch. We're like, right. oh, you need the exact, it has to be a cripple, yeah. it has to be this spinner stage, it has to right. be that stage, stage. It's always stage, stage, stage. They're defining the fly by the stage. And I said, well, it doesn't matter. You just tie them all in whatever color, but this that silhouette of the stage matches. Right. right? If you're tying a cripple, yeah. a cripple looks like a cripple underwater. It's a shadow. Um, right. You know, now those pick, fish can be really picky, but you can get away with 90% of the, the their performance doing that right right then right. you go to other areas like outside of the ranch a ranch is dry fly only right so yep. it has to be super picky in areas but if you're fishing that with a dropper i mean you're like deadly in comparison right yeah so yeah um it's so a couple things to think about there so so tell me a little bit about let's first define ecology right because i think people get mixed with ecology and entomology and then right. let's talk a little bit from there okay yeah, yeah. So ecology is a lot more general, and realistically, my degree is in environmental science. Um, and so I, uh, I did my undergraduate studies um, more so in environmental science, just general policy, a lot of stuff related to fisheries, hydrology, all that kind of stuff. But it's definitely more of a generalist pursuit, whereas entomology is specifically related to bugs, or hydrology is specifically related to water, or dendrology is specifically related to like trees and shrubs and that kind of stuff. So. I'm I'm more of the jack of all trades. Um, and then during my, my graduate studies, I got more into soil science, um, working on a thesis uh, hmm. for California Healthy Soils. And so, you know, I, I did a lot of research on, um, you know, greenhouse gas emissions coming from soils and then also how that lends into to water stuff is more so nitrogen pollution and that kind of stuff as well, um, which is a big, big issue, um, especially yeah. on a lot of Western streams too. So, uh, yeah, ecology is just more generalist. This is off the cuff, but do you know of any really good reads or videos um, available about river ecology that might apply yeah. here? Yeah, there's a, there's definitely um, – I, I, Trout Unlimited has a lot of really good stuff, honestly, on their website. And that's just kind of basic stuff that will get you more and more into river ecology. Um, okay. And then OSU, Oregon State University, they have a really, really, really good program. Um, that kind of gets into the more specifics of hydrology and river ecology and stuff. Uh, and you know, that's, that's close and personal to my heart because, uh, I fish <laughs> a lot of streams around that area. And so, um, they put out a lot of really good publications, uh, for scientific articles. If you're looking on getting into kind of the deeper end of that kind of stuff, um, mm-hmm. they have a lot of really good articles on coastal cutthroat habitat management and all that kind of stuff. Um, and you know, if you're going to read scientific articles and you don't, don't have a background in it, 
Um, I would definitely start off with the Trout Unlimited stuff and the basics and then kind of get into some of those more scientific articles, just even reading yeah. the abstract, you know? Um, yeah. But that's that's kind of my go-to. I do a lot of scientific article reading for this kind of stuff a lot of the time, and they put out a lot of good stuff. Yeah, and I like I like taking those like Trout Unlimited articles because right. they are so abstract and, and really just looking for the scientific nomenclature to yeah. lead off of and go, oh, this right. is this scientific nomenclature is what they're really talking about. Then I might Google right. that and find a couple papers and find something that's really of interest to me. That's like you said, much more detailed, much more scientific, et cetera. But right. sometimes one of those lanes can lead into something that just gives you that aha moment when it comes to fishing of like, right. ah, I want to look for this in my local rivers and you see it. And then usually when you see something like that, especially like scientific levels, you see secondary and tertiary aspects of that. Right. Right. So right. is it a healthy environment because of a, well then B and C usually exist. And you start to see that as a pattern across rivers that you might fish, et cetera. So it's really cool. Really cool. Right. Right. Yeah. And they're not mutually exclusive. I I'm, I'm a big fan of saying that ecology makes you better fly fishermen, but being a fly fisherman makes you a better ecologist specifically yep. for river ecology too. You learn, okay, I know where the fish hold. Why do they hold in this area specifically? Are they looking for large woody debris? Which is actually a term used in hydrology for like structure and habitat. Okay. Um, and they do counts on it too. It's, it's pretty cool. Um, and then they, uh, you know, why are they holding in this area? Okay, well, there's a lot more oxygen available here. There's colder water during the middle of the day. And that teaches you about ecology and ecology teaches you about fly mm. fishing. And so I see the two as pretty much inseparable at this point. And, uh, you know, you don't, you don't need a degree in ecology to get better at fly fishing. No. Just kind of go off some of those, um, some of those well, basic instincts, you know? Yeah. You just hit two right there. Large woody debris. Okay. Yeah. Well, if, if there's a way for me to look at a river or get information that determines, Hey, there's more large woody debris areas on this river, then I would know there was more habitat. Right. Yeah. S same yeah. thing with water temperature. Oh, well, average water temperature is this. That's great. But are there, you know, per mile X number of cold spots in the river? Right. Well, that changes right. it a little different. You know, right. I'll use the example of um, fishing to Gallatin up in uh, Montana. And I, I fished it in the dead of winter. And what was one of the major things we fished? We fished springs. Yeah. Everywhere where we knew where it was a spring, we were catching fish like there was. No tomorrow, and it was like negative four out or something like. It was so cold. Yep. But yeah, anywhere else it was like brutal trying to fish. So, you know, you start to learn those little things to look for, and boy, it can turn a rotten day into a great day. I mean, we had an awesome day. Yeah, we were yeah, cold. Very though. true. We were yeah, absolutely yeah. frozen. <laughs> <laughs> I remember taking my waders oh. off and thinking, "Oh, I'll just ball those up and put them in the truck," and they were like loaves yeah. of bread in each leg you know it's just super solid oh, man i'll tell you what winter steelhead fishing here it isn't the same level of like coldness in terms of like temperatures and negatives and wind and well i guess we get we get a pretty good amount of wind but it's just it's the same thing it's just cold and miserable and it's pouring because like you know western oregon is famous for being super rainy and uh, it's just not for the faint of heart you know one of my favorite books is sometimes a great notion he kind of describes the oregon coast range as a place where you cannot get dry no matter how hard you try. And that's kind of what winter steelhead yeah. fishing is for me. But you love it. You know, it's like you're out there chasing these giant chrome fish that are beautiful. Yeah. And when you catch them, it's like a unicorn, but it's miserable in the meantime. You know, you have to deal with the elements for yeah, sure. Yeah. Same thing with a gallatin, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, if you're a cold weather angler, I got a couple tips for you. One is get a pair of boot fit waders. They're warmer than anything else I've ever discovered. The other one is, is... The um, hot hands, the little shaker packs, hot hands, they're Definitely. cheap and you can put a couple in your shirt, in your waiter or in your pouch inside your waiter and it heats it up. I you do the same thing, cold nights in a sleeping bag. There's nothing like it. It's like having a furnace, put one yeah. or two of those in there and it'll keep your bag warm all night. So there's, yeah. there's a few little cold weather tips for you, but it is yeah. frigid up there where you were talking yeah. about. I had a, oh, a yeah. guy that worked for me. He was at the time, I think president of the like Oregon coast winter surfing group. I mean, it was like six people, but oh wow, he would show me pictures of them and little video clips. This was a long time ago before that stuff was like on Instagram and whatnot. 
but they'd yeah. be running out to the car, like struggling with their frigid hands, trying to just get the door open and get into the car and turn it on. And, you know, they had a guy after a while, they had, we'd have a guy sit in the car and wait with it warm and he'd help everybody get in and then he'd go surf. And it was really wild. He's like, man, it's, it's just so bitter cold. But oh, like you man. said, when you get a crummy, his was, but when you get barreled, man, there's nothing like it, bro. It's so good. I mean, he would just I'll like go on and on. Yeah, no, I, I, I learned how to surf in Oregon before going down to school in California in, in an area that's pretty good for surfing. And they're a different breed up here, you know, I yeah. mean, it's five, four wetsuits with hoods and five millimeter gloves and booties. And it's the people yeah. that are out there love it. And it's the same thing with winter steelhead fishing. The people that are out there love it. And there's a reason for it, yeah. but it's, it's just not for everyone. You know, it's, yeah. it's difficult. Yeah, it, <laughs> yeah, it's a diehard scenario. And you, I think it's uh, the people that love it are the ones that were lucky enough or skilled enough to get yeah. the the finish line effect right early yeah. on, yeah, exactly. and then it's like I want that again. It's worth it. Yeah, you yeah. know, it's uh, it's the carrot. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. When it, when it's it's a shame that some people never get to experience that, right? Yeah. But yeah, those exactly. that do, man, what an addiction! So really cool. Yeah. So tell yeah, us some more is. about ecology. Why don't you uh, maybe kind of talk about a local river of yours and how that's affected you? Sure. Yeah. 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 Um, well, there's a, there's God, there's so many to talk about. Um, I think that one of my favorites are just some of the coastal rivers that I, uh, I, I fly fish a lot more now. My parents live down in um, the Oregon coast part time. So I'll go down there a lot of the time. And uh, the cool thing about fly fishing the Oregon coast is you can be on the beach and then in 15 minutes, you can be fly fishing a local river. And, um, you know, they're, they're not super well known in terms of resident trout populations, but the cutthroats <laughs> fight really hard. The, the cool ecological thing, like you said, is they don't experience a ton of runoff because um, the coastal range doesn't have a huge snowpack, whereas, you know, the Cascades, which is kind of like you have the coastal range right here. I, I, uh, and then you go in a little bit more to the east and you have Portland and kind of the Willamette Valley. And then you keep on going east and you have the Cascades that you have to go over to get to Bend and that kind of famous area and mm -hmm. everything. Um, the coast range is a lot smaller in terms of elevation than the Cascades are. And so they don't get the same snowpack and a lot of the, the coastal rivers don't experience that early season runoff like, you know, the mm. Mackenzie and the Deschutes and everything do. Right. And so early in the year, that's kind of my go to place. And if you call local fly shops in Oregon, they'll tell you the same thing. If you're, you know, looking in late May, early June, right when our, our trout season begins, that's that's where you want to go. And it's, it's really interesting because a lot of them are really surrounded by a lot of agriculture outside of Portland and Eugene and Bend. Um, most of the state of Oregon is pretty sparsely populated and, you know, depending on what you like, it's, it's either a cool thing or it's a weird thing, especially if you're, uh, yeah, yeah. Especially if you're coming up from California too. Um, I spent six years down there and that's where my, my fiance is from. And it's, it's a very, very different, um, different kind of vibe getting out in the country there. Uh, especially like Yosemite and all that kind of stuff versus like going to some of the some of the more well-known natural areas here away from the major cities. It's, it's a lot yeah. more sparsely populated, you know? Interesting. Um, hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So same thing with the Oregon coast and there's, there's a lot of agriculture around there. Uh, so a lot of the time I'm fishing by cows and that kind of stuff, which is, is, is really cool. Honestly, I'd rather be around cows than around a bunch of people, honestly. So uh, yeah, that's a, that's a fun thing. Um, but you know, the management of that stream is really different. Um, compared to some of the really well-known like wild rivers that we have, like Metolius or uh, even mm -hmm. the Mackenzie to some extent in, in national forest land. Um, and so that's just, that's a completely different consideration because you usually have a lot of cutback vegetation and then usually you'll have animals on the other side. And, uh, you know, that kind of gets into like reading the river a little bit differently and understanding like, you know, if there's not as much vegetation present, you know, reading the river in terms of where there would be bugs and uh, where the fish would be holding, waiting for some bigger dinner. So it's a lot more, you know, tail end of riffles, that kind of stuff. And then still water, making sure they drop down streamers and stuff too. Yeah. Talk a little bit about that. So is the water managed typically by the agricultural community in those, in those streams because of that um, location, that proximity of location? Yeah, so um, that's that's a really good question, and I think it's it's uh, I I can't speak to all of them, but I can kind of give you a general idea to the extent that I know. I think that um, you know the water management is something that's a little bit outside of my area, but from what I understand, a lot of the towns on the Oregon coast kind of rely on those rivers for <clears throat> water um, for the town population. In addition, you know you have water rights that 
when you have senior water rights guarantees people um, the ability to take some of that water for agriculture every year. And that's kind of where you get into the stuff like the Klamath, um, a lot of the, the disagreements that are going on down there and a lot of that history is um, coming from the senior water rights and everything too, which just means those people have been there for a really long time. Mm -hmm. And uh, when in low water years, the senior water rights holders are the first ones to get their water, depending on um, the availability of it as well. Okay. Uh, and so, yeah, yeah. So that's kind of how the water is managed in general. Um, in terms of uh, just water quality and everything, there's, there's regional water quality boards uh, that do a lot of the management for that as well, from my understanding. And those regional water quality boards, what do, is there a basic premise that they're using for water quality or is it broad spectrum of this one uses this measurement, this one uses that measurement kind of thing? Right. Yeah. And, and again, this isn't something that I, uh, I have in like intimate knowledge of, but um, I can right. kind of speak generally. And I, you know, I, I know a lot more about California's cause that's where I went to school to study this kind of stuff. But I think that there's a lot of similarities in Oregon as well. Um, so what, what I can say is there's a lot of uh, discharge that they look for in terms of just, you know, nitrate concentrations, mm -hmm. um, you know, dissolved content of pollution, uh, a lot of non-point source and point source pollution as well. Um, and so they kind of measure that dissolved oxygen is a huge thing that they measure temperature, all that kind of stuff. So it's more holistic what they're looking for mm -hmm. um, in terms of, hey, can this still support a healthy fish population a lot of the time? And when you get into coastal rivers, you know, they're, uh, they, they warm up a lot quicker than some of that discharge from mountain streams does. And so, you know, temperature definitely plays a factor in that kind of stuff. So always take a temperature a thermometer with you if you're going to fish some of okay. those streams. Yeah. And I would assume that's because of elevation is a primary, right? You're getting yeah. warmer weather or you're getting warmer winds coming off the ocean and things like that as well. Yeah, yeah, kind of. Also, just the fact that it doesn't have snowpack discharge throughout the season. You know, as you get into higher and mm -hmm. higher elevations, June, it starts to melt at lower elevations, whereas August, like Mount Hood, is even bare some years. And so, right. you know, when you get those really warm years and you don't get a lot of rain feed into those coastal streams, it warms mm -hmm. up a lot quicker. There's a lot lower water. And, um, you know, I mean, even just going there June to September, uh, I went to the, the, my home water kind of area on, yeah. uh, you know, in, on the Oregon coast in June. And then I went in September and I took pictures and you can see a huge, huge decrease in water levels. Just in Oh, interesting. Times. Yeah. Now, you know, one of the primary concerns a lot of us have about, especially here in the West of uh, lack of vegetation near the rivers is erosion, right? Yeah. You know, there were periods where people came in and destroyed all the willows because that was a problematic area and we went, didn't want them. And then they realized, oh, the willows hold the banks together. And if you destroy those, the banks wear away, the river becomes shallow, the shallow water becomes warm, the fish habitat becomes useless, yeah. right? So yeah. can can you maybe touch on that kind of subject area and what maybe some of the concerns or, or disconcerns are in your um, your region? Yeah, yeah. So bank erosion is, is definitely a huge issue. And I think it's just kind of dependent on, on the specific streams, too. They all have different soil types that erode differently. Um, but one of the things that I can say is that vegetation is just all around a good thing to have. I mean, think about it. It supports insect populations as well in terms of, you know, insects need a place to hatch. You know, they need shelter. Trout need shelter and shade. And they're waiting under a lot of those taller trees a lot of the time for those insect hatches to happen and to, you know, be opportunistic and come up and gulp, you know, some some bugs hatching off of some of those trees are falling off a lot of the time, too. Um, it, it's been shown to improve water quality a lot of the time, too. And so it's just it's one of those things where there's there's a billion different studies on how streamside vegetation is so necessary for trout habitat, for stream health and, and all that kind of stuff, honestly. OK. Yeah, I mean, that's what I had assumed was kind of viewed as and seen as, right? It's very similar yeah. across the board, but it does. It provides all those little micro environments for fish to thrive in or on or upon, right? So really right. cool to kind of see that as well. So from a reading water standpoint, I would assume a lot of those things that you see as an ecologist, they're relatively um, blanketed across from a regional pers perspective of like, yeah, we're always looking for woody areas, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe could you, could you educate us on that? Yeah, definitely. And you're, you're right. It is definitely a very regional thing. Like uh, 
you know, I, I have a friend that's out in kind of the golden area and you fish those streams a lot differently than you fish Western Oregon streams like the Mackenzie um, up by Mackenzie Bridge is kind of where I learned how to fly fish Fin Rock area. Um, and that's really or, or used to be, unfortunately, they had some really devastating wildfires in the past couple of years. Um, but it, it used to be super heavily blanketed by old growth Douglas fir forest, right? To the point where I didn't, I didn't really <clears throat> learn how to, yeah. So I didn't, I didn't learn how to back cast until I was probably 16 or 17 and started going other places. Cause you couldn't, you would snag yourself on a tree whenever you tried to back cast, you couldn't wait out far enough in the Mackenzie to take a full back cast. So, uh, a lot of roll casting and stuff, but it, it changed the way that you fish because during the middle of the day you could still do really well on non-terrestrial dry flies underneath a lot of that vegetation because it was so thick that, you know, there were areas that were blanketed by shade for most of the day. And if, you know, you've ever been to Western Oregon, the Willamette Valley, you know, we have a lot of ferns that kind of grow underneath these canopies for the same reason. It's because they don't see a lot of exposure to sunlight. It's, it's kind of this damp, cold, shaded area. And right. the same thing applies to a lot of those streamside habitats as well, right? Yeah. Right, but then the bug life is also specific to a lot of those areas too. I mean, there's bug life right. that's specific to ferns, bug bug life that's specific to, you know, right. the conifer, et cetera. So yeah, really right. interesting to hear that. Right. Yeah. Whereas, you know, you go to some places that have more intense sun, you're at elevation, you don't have as much streamside vegetation. And it's like during the middle of the day, you're, you know, terrestrials or streamers a lot of the time too, because there's a lot more of that light that's um, impacting the river that's getting through to that, you know, to the water and heating it up. Whereas there's some areas where it's like, it doesn't see sun all day on some right, of right, right. rivers as well. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah like some yeah. of those swirls on the Metolius, man, they don't ever see the light of day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> beautiful yeah. places, but man, putting a drift room is tough. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I've <laughs> lost a lot of bugs to some of those snags before. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's too cool. That's too cool. So um, as, as an ecologist, while you were going through school and education and, and fly fishing, could you give us some of the uh, top areas where you felt like, man, this really taught me a lot? And it could go either way, you know, fishing ecology or vice versa. Yeah, yeah, I definitely can. And I think that honestly, um, one of the best places to start is just kind of with the fact that... Uh, there's this huge idea within the kind of the area that I studied in ecology, just kind of general policy when I started out first of uh, stakeholder engagement. And I think that that's one of the most important areas as well Is the future of fly fishing is so dependent on stakeholder engagement and getting people into the sport and making sure that everyone feels welcome. And like, like I said, you know, I have a lot of experience surfing and that kind of stuff. And there's, there's ties over in between the two of them where it's like, we have public lands and we want people to use our public lands to be able to see what we see because people only really protect what they care about. Um, and, you know, I can get into some equivalencies with the fact that like, you know, cute animals usually are the ones that get protected, right? When people see cute polar bears and stuff <laughs> like that, they get protected. You know, you need that fact. Catch all the baby brookies you can. Did you hear that? Everyone? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, uh, you you really need that buy-in from people to say, hey, I care about this. I've experienced this, um, and this is something that I want to protect. I want to help be part of the solution for. Um, and I think that that's one of the biggest areas for me is, like, you know, teach people all you can. When you're out there on the water, you're a representative of the sport, you know. Be kind to other people and help get them engaged and show them what you care about. Because as anglers, we, we all care about the future and, you know, our kids being able to fish the same areas that we did, you know, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and that was honestly the most overarching thing that stood out to me is just the impact of education and engagement on protection of environmental areas, too, especially on the west, uh, the west side of the Rockies, too, where we have, um, you know, a lot of natural resources that are extractable. Um, engagement and protection of those is, is something that, uh, you know, we, we definitely don't take for granted. Um, so that's, that's kind of overall the first thing that, that tied into that. And then second would just be the impact of native vegetation as well, right? You have these, these insects that are used to specific kinds of vegetation. Um, for, for example, in Oregon, blackberries are a huge issue here. Uh, yeah. and yeah, yeah. So, um, actually there's some cool programs that exist to go into like, you know, streamside management programs. And I know that there's one in Oregon specifically called the riparian lands tax incentive which 
kind of uh, enables agricultural or even just private landowners to enter into management plans for streamside hmm. like riparian land management. And so they create a management plan. It's it's a two page form, super simple. They actually get tax incentives for for helping manage that land. And a really common one is just like removal of blackberries or replanting of native vegetation, all that kind of stuff. Because it's it's that important for the terrestrial life. It's that important for you know fish health and all that kind of stuff to have hmm. native vegetation and not just manicured lawns because they rely on that pollination. They rely on the availability of that shelter and everything to be able to produce these prolific hatches. And I know Patagonia fly fishing has done a lot of great work recently on like, uh, I think it's called like, where did all the hatches go or something kind of talking hmm. about the impacts of pesticides and, you mm-hmm. know, like some of the reduction of native vegetation on some of these insect hatches and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think that those are kind of two of the main areas outside of, you know, some of the very, very specific stuff, like, you know, the hydrology, and uh, the idea of large woody debris, which is kind of intuitive to a lot of fly fishers. They know about structure. They know about dissolved oxygen and oxygenation in streams, you know, fish yep. below riffles and that kind of stuff and fish structure, all that kind of stuff where it's like, you know, it's kind of intuitive, but you learn some of the proper scientific names for this kind of stuff, even though large woody debris doesn't sound that scientific, right. you know? <laughs> but um, then you also understand, too, that like, if it's important enough to do scientific research on, it's right. probably a big thing and it's probably yeah. an area you should be knowledgeable about. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, definitely. is it going to stop you from catching fish? No. No. Right. But is it going to educate you on the waters around you? Is it going to help you um, maybe define that to another friend who's a new angler, um, et right. cetera, et cetera, down the line? I mean, it, uh, for me, some of that stuff's just cool to know, right? It's like being yeah. a tour guide on the river for either right. yourself or someone else, you know? Yeah. Uh, makes your yeah. day interesting, that ever learning thing. Very cool. Yeah. I do and, I do have a question about the blackberries uh, sure. because it came out. Do you know why they're considered, um, I guess, uh, a, a problem area? Is it are they like a noxious weed and get rid of yeah. other things, et cetera? Yeah, they they grow super well up here and they are super, super invasive. If, um, you know, if, if anyone listening to this lives in the Portland area or even just Western Oregon, they know exactly what I'm talking about. I uh, they're super hard to remove, too, because they have all the thorns on them and everything. And, I've mm-hmm. you know, I've I've done my time as uh, as a landscaper before when I was growing <laughs> up as one of my first jobs. And I've removed so much blackberries. that I don't know if my hands will ever heal from that kind of stuff. Right, right, right. But um they grow so well and it's just, they are so invasive that they suffocate out a lot of native vegetation, okay. not necessarily like the big trees or anything, but some of the smaller shrubs smaller. and that kind of stuff. Yeah. They'll grow all over it and they'll make sure it never sees the light of day. And it's, it's weird because like, I love blackberry season here. It's yeah. kind of one of those things where it's like, we have it, you might as well enjoy it. You know, it's, it's not feasible yeah. to remove every it's single piece. Huckleberries but... in Montana and uh, uh, Idaho. It's raspberries in uh, northern uh, uh, Utah. It's, yeah, exactly. Right. You get on the list. Right. But the one thing yeah. that's interesting is Oregon. You have so much moisture and those yeah. berry bushes, <laughs> you can cut them down to the roots. But if they have moisture, they'll grow back and they'll grow back prolific. So... Uh, yeah, it's a perfect kind of position for them there. It's really interesting. Yeah, that and bamboo, just impossible to, oh, to get yeah. out of your backyard. I mean, yeah. it's just... And bamboo's a big invasive for sure. Yeah, 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 yeah definitely. Um, My dad got yeah. into that, and his tip was don't plant the... Ba- he was using bamboo as a um, almost like a fence line, right? Right, right, right. And um, he built... Uh, I don't know what you call like a trough along the fence, right? But instead of right. burying, instead of having the trough just full of dirt, he buried five gallon buckets. They were all rooted in five gallon yeah. buckets. And he says, otherwise it just gets way out of control. You can't control That's it. That's so, so funny. The <laughs> same thing happened in a, the same thing happened at my parents' house when we moved in there too. They tried to use it as like a privacy fence line. They, they buried five gallon buckets of plastic ones. And yeah. it's so strong that it broke through them. It's like out oh, of control wow. now. I mean, my dad spent like a week every year just packing it up with a pickaxe. When I go to visit them, you know. <laughs> yeah. And it's crazy. You can buy shoots and stuff online at Amazon for a yeah. couple bucks. So, yeah. Yeah. Always be careful yeah. with your, your buying and planting. It's not 
normal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, not a not a fly fishing tip, but a home owning tip. Don't plant yeah. bamboo if you live in Western Oregon. <laughs> right. right. You'll regret spend, it. Man. <laughs> spend your time tying flies and fishing is way better. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, that's too cool, man. Hey, Max, you you mentioned to me, uh, and I'm curious if it falls in line with some of this education standpoint. But you mentioned you started um, with another group, a um, a nonprofit basalt to basalt to breaks. Is that what it is? Yeah. So it's called basalt to breakers. And, uh, I, I started a nonprofit with, um, a couple of people that I knew from school that were just some of the smartest people that I knew, uh, to kind of help preserve Oregon's native trout species. Um, I think, you know, the cool thing about living up here is that we have a huge salmon population, thriving salmon population a lot of the time too. Um, and they get a lot of focus. And I think the Oregon's native trout species was kind of my initial love. Uh, for you know ecology and so mm -hmm. um, I wanted to start a more local grassroots thing to kind of help preserve that and then also to launch Oregon's first native trout challenge as well um, that's currently in the works we're still engaging some of the key stakeholders across the state in that but we're hoping to debut that kind of late Q1 next year um, and yeah it's it's a great little nonprofit. I uh, we're, we're fiscally sponsored by the Oregon Wildlife Foundation which is a fantastic nonprofit, um, 501c3 and uh, it's it's just it's a blast to get to engage with the community across my home state <laughs> and uh, get to talk to everyone about the importance of conserving native trout. Yeah, and it's a cool niche because it's I I would have to agree with you. It's a niche that doesn't get a ton of attention in the media, et cetera. Um, right. And it's such a unique table stake to environment, right? Right, right. That, that exists. It's not going away. And the importance to both ends of the spectrum is really high, right? Yeah. Whether it's above or below um, that native trout um, stream scenario, it's it's really important to the, the survival of both species. Oh, it truly is. And it's uh, it's one of those really cool things where I think that Oregon has a very unique voice from an ecological perspective, right? You know, especially going to school in California, living basically five minutes away from Washington to Oregon kind of gets glanced over sometimes with some of this stuff. But we really do have some of the most interesting ecology on the West Coast. And that's why we call it the basalt breakers. You get all the basalt, you know, way up in eastern Oregon and Bend area and all that kind of stuff, all the way to like literally breakers. I mean, steelhead, you know, go out to the ocean and come back yeah. in. And it's just, it's, this, yeah. it's really cool, holistic thing that I think um, gets, gets overlooked for other native fish populations sometimes, but just, uh, you know, helping lend some credence to that kind of stuff in the, in the next, uh, in the upcoming months as we kind of iron out the details for that challenge, you know? Well, that's really cool. If I can help you just let me know. Okay. It got, definitely uh, will. <laughs> we'll get some, get some ears on it for you. Uh, cool. Max, let's do this. Um, we covered quite a bit there. Lots of little micro areas in ecology, which was really cool. I think we're all yeah. going to leave a little better for that one. But let's talk a little bit about um, coastal rivers for native trout, which you touched base on a little bit. But you have some tips that you yeah. create on your Instagram page. Um, I really like them. And that's how you and I really started the conversation is I started looking at your tips and they're very visual. So you'll... For example, take a picture of a stream section and you'll number out the lies. Here's number one lie, two, three, and four. That's where right. I would fish. Or um, identify these things in your river. And I just thought from an educational standpoint, being able to see an example from a beginner standpoint and then actually know the answer um, and get a good answer. And right. a lot of times you'll write up why they're good places. Um, yeah. which is super helpful. So to accelerate your learning curve in all phases, I thought it was really good. Um, maybe take one or two of those and, and break them down for us uh, from a tip standpoint, and then, then we'll call it a day. Yeah, yeah, that sounds great. Um, two, of, two of the best ones that I have, honestly, one is kind of what you were just talking about too. I try and put a lot of, when I go to a river, I try and take a good video and say, you know, where would be the only cast that you would take in this river? Where are you sure that there's a fish in this river? And it's also kind of building a community, right? You know, it, lowering the barriers um, of accessibility for fly fishing. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people, you know, they don't have family teaching them about fly fishing like I did growing up and was, was so lucky to have. Or they, you know, they can't go hire a guide or something like that. And so it's like, hey, let's have the community help you understand how to read water more. And so you can go look in the comments and you can see 
a lot of the people that have been fly fishing their whole life, like, okay, I would say spot three because it's really, you know, it's a really good riffle. It's yeah. the tail end of a riffle and there's, you know, a lot of oxygen. There will be some fish in there, right? Or like, what fly would you use here? That kind of stuff. You just put together those series to help people understand like, hey, I can actually go to this post. I can look through and I can see a section of river that I might not fish, but it looks similar to some of the sections that I, I might fish on a regular basis and see, mm -hmm. okay, this is where the community's kind of overwhelming majority opinion says there should be a fish and I can learn from that, right? Yeah, because I, I would agree. When I first started fly fishing, I remember being in that situation where you would cast in the certain lanes or holes and you'd be like, you wouldn't catch anything. And it was, it was a question for me. Am I even in the right place? Right. Yeah. At that yeah. time, I wasn't advanced enough to know, no, dude, you need to be down by the bottom and you'll catch fish, but I yeah. wouldn't be catching fish. And then I'd be like, whoa, what's going on? Or I'd be yeah. on a bobber rig that was just like zooming by, you know, cause the top water was so fast or whatever. Yeah. And yeah. then when I figured out the other things, it was like, yeah, I am in the right place. I just need to adjust these little things, but that's not only going to make me successful here. It's going to make me successful in a bunch of other places. So yeah. that's what I really liked about it is like you said, that passing on information kind of thing where, you know, I didn't have, I had a couple of buddies that fly fish. They helped me at the start, but a lot of it was like, right. we'll be over here, you know, yeah. fish yeah, this part. Exactly. It's pretty good. Yeah. I've caught fish here, you know? <laughs> Yeah. And I mean, I'm not going to lie. Nothing can be time on the water and just kind of figuring it out yourself. Cause it really is just a mental thing of kind of like learning from your mistakes and learning from your success. And that's still how I learned to this day, being on the water and just trying out different things teaches you the most, but you know, understanding kind of the generalist principles for that kind of stuff. I, I found super helpful even. Mm -hmm. um, and then another one of the things I like to do too, is kind of just do gear recommendations or just some tips and tricks for gear. Cause uh, I mean, you know, we all know that fly fishing is expensive. It's an expensive hobby. It's expensive to get into and stuff too. And so, um, you know, I, I grew up in the city of Portland, went to public school in the city of Portland and just, you know, try to be conscious about the costs associated with some of this kind of stuff because we're, we're all stakeholders in native trout populations. And, yeah. You know, I want to increase accessibility to it. So having recommendations for like, hey, here's here's a pretty cheap entry level rod that'll be fantastic. You know, where to look for used gear, where to what what reel do you need? Just even the basics of like how do I get started with this if I don't have yeah. someone that can loan me a rod? What you know, how can I not spend five hundred bucks on my first setup before I even know if this is something that I'm I'm gonna be into, you know? Yeah. Um and so that's that's another one of those posts that I usually do. And for anyone out there that's curious, like one of my favorite first rods for people that I've taught a billion people how to fish on um, is an Echo Carbon XL. Echo's like a Vancouver area, Portland area yeah. manufacturer. Um, really re reasonably priced rod, especially if you get it used, has a good amount of action, like a kind of a medium fast action. So it's forgiving for sure. Um, mm -hmm. but something that I still fish even like it's my travel rod when I don't want to take my really nice ones on a plane. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's, the boat that's rod, a great right? It's the one you put on the boat in case it gets stepped on or something. You're not dying over it, but you're, you're upset. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but you're exactly. not dying over it. But I agree. Yeah. I do yeah. the same thing. I, I list, um, I list gear that I use on every podcast episode in the notes. There's yep. a list. And yep. I click through like, oh, hey, go check it out on this website. But like you, I do the same thing. Like what's – what I look for is like quality and lifetime value. Yeah. For example, I might spend a little more on a wool sock yeah. than I would because the wool is going to last forever and it's really important to your feet. Same thing yeah. with waders. Waders are a big one for me. Like I'll spend a lot of money on waders because the last thing I want is to have a waiter problem on a trip that I just spent right. a lot of money getting on or yep. um, eight miles from the house. And I got four days playing and I'm like dealing with a leaky waiter or something. This is just not worth it for me. Plus yeah. you wear, it's like a bed. I sleep in my bed every night. Waders yeah. I wear every day, usually on a trip, you know? Exactly. It's, and that's, I see. Oh, Go ahead. Sorry. But that's uh, it, was, you know, it's like yeah. some things you spend a little more on, some things you go, okay, it makes sense to go here with, and that's why, so. 
Yeah, and that's that's kind of like I, I've always fished a sage rod because my dad still has sage rods from the '80s. Same thing with Hardy reels. Like my grandpa brought some back when Scientific Anglers and Hardy were still partnered. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's that's the reel that I still have and grease it up, and it works great. You know, it's like that's and so it's like it's kind of those two tiers where it's like, hey, this is an intro level that will get you this far, and then here's like, you know, I always when my friends are getting better at fly fishing, like I'm looking for a good rod and everything. I'm just like, well, I fished the sage my entire life and I still have the one that my dad has had since he was a kid. So yeah, yeah. hard to beat that kind of stuff. Well, you know, it's, same you thing know, with waiters. It's like a car, right? When you're young and 16, you might get a cheap car because you really just need right. to get from point A to B and, and figure it out. And then you realize, you know what, I'm an adult now. And now I make a little bit more money. I do this as a hobby. I do it as a time to enjoy myself. I want to enjoy everything around me. That's everything from my shoes to my hat, right? Yeah. And that might change my perspective. Yeah, now I'm going to take a look at investing in something that's a, a little more expensive because of the way it looks, the way it feels, the... Yeah. You know, et cetera, et cetera, the, light, the value of it, if I want to pass it on to a family member, all of those things change, right? Yeah. So, and there's no one fit that's right or wrong. Yeah. It's more of who am I and what am I looking for right now? So, right. Yeah. I really right. Like yeah. It. My, <laughs> my, my habit with cars has not been great. I have a 1980 air cooled van again. That's probably yeah. not the, the, <laughs> the best example for me, but yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. In general. <laughs> well, I own like beater Subarus for years, you know, and they, they I needed great. to have four wheel drive to get anywhere because yep. I live in the mountains of Park City. And it was like, yeah, I remember my little girl, she used to refer to my car as the rusty bucket. Yep. yep. <laughs> you know, dad, are you going to drive the rusty bucket? You know, and it was like the cutest oh, yeah. thing on earth. But, you know, and now she doesn't have to call it a rusty bucket. It's a, I got yep. a forerunner, right? Yep. There do, you I, go. do I need a, uh, a build up forerunner? Probably not more than once a year. <laughs> Most yeah, of the time yeah, it's exactly. on dirt roads, you know? Yeah. So, uh, but that hey, I funny. enjoy it. That was my gift to myself for surviving cancer. So there you go. I had a reason there you behind go. it. <laughs> there you go, man. Yeah, there you go. Well, Max, thanks for being on the show, man. Um, people can get a hold of you at Max underscore Mountain underscore Stream. Um, excuse me, McCool underscore Mountain Sorry. underscore Stream, like a like a McCool Mountain Stream. And then the Basalt to Breakers is Basalt underscore two T O underscore Breakers. So yep. um, this stuff will be in the notes for us. And uh, again, thanks for reaching out, Matt. Max. It was great that you listened to the show and you, you took some action on it to say hello and thanks and look at, look at us now, man. So uh, I really appreciate yeah. it. We'll uh, yeah. talk to you soon, bud. Okay. Yep. Great. Thanks everyone. That's, uh, that's all we got this week. Thanks Mac for all that you participated in and uh, we'll see you next week.